Okay, so the first, uh, first, I just want to mention the objective, right? The objective for today is the first Gauss's law objective. Um, we're going to be able to under uh, three dot or a dot three b state the law in an integral form and apply it qualitatively to relate flux and electric charge for a specified surface. So that's um, that's for today. Okay, so here we go. Uh, you should be able to see my paper here for Gauss's law. So what we did, we spent a, uh, you know maybe a week talking about electric flux, um, and we figured out the electric flux through a closed surface, or well, the electric flux through any surface is the integral of e dot dA. And if we think of the surface as a closed surface, um, then this this integral is a surface integral. So we integrate over the entire surface, and that can in general be pretty complicated. Um, but for the purposes of this class, it'll only be simple surface integrals that we need to do. And you'll see the one today is, uh, is pretty simple. All right, so we're going to start uh, figuring out Gauss's law by seeing if we can figure out what is the flux through a sphere of radius r uh, if there's a point charge q right at the center. All right, so we're starting with a point charge at the center of a sphere. We're going to find the flux, and then we're going to see what we can generalize from that. All right, well, we know um, the electric field from the, so we're gonna start with our equation from up here, right? We wanna find the surface integral of the electric field dot producted, the dot product of the electric field uh, with the area vector. So we can start plugging things in, right? We know what the electric field is from a point charge, right? Can somebody tell me that? Um, columns law, so K mm -hmm. and then Q, K times Q over R squared. Yeah, KQ over R squared, that's the magnitude of the field from a point charge, but what about the, we also need the direction, right? What direction is that in? Easy thing to forget when we write down Coulomb's law, but it is a vector. What them course on theta, but this is going in all directions. Yeah, no, not tight. Well, but it, but it's going in the direction of. Um, let's see, do we have it on here? Yeah, this is the magnitude of Gauss's law. But for the, if we want to include the direction, it's in the r hat direction, right? It always points radially outwards. So at this point, right, the the radius vector points upwards. At this point, radius vector points to the right, and so on. But we need to have this r hat in there for the electric field. And when we did Coulomb's law, we did have that. Um, so that's our electric field. And we want to take the dot product of that with the um, area vector, right? So we can notice something very convenient here about the direction of the area vector compared with the direction of r hat. What can we say about if, if I pick any little dA, right? I've drawn in on this sphere just one little uh, you know, piece of the area of the of the surface of the sphere. And if I draw the normal to that, how does that normal vector correspond to the R hat vector? Mr. When you say sphere, you mean the volume? You mean like, you mean like a whole circle sphere? Yeah, sphere, like, three dimensions. So 3D. Yeah. Yeah, so we're imagining a sphere, a ball, right? With a point charge at the center of it. Um, and we want to figure out what the electric, how many electric field lines pass through that sphere, right, on the way out. Through that point in the sphere or through the sphere in general? Through the entire sphere, right? This is a surface integral, so we're doing it over the whole sphere. But in order well, to, well, to look at a little piece, right, the dA. Right? Well, then the volume of a sphere is four-thirds part. Uh, that's although. The, yep, that's the volume of the sphere. But what I'm oh. looking at is the, yeah. well, First of all, we're looking more at the surface area of the sphere. Um, and first, before we can do any calculations, we need to figure out what the what the direction of this um, dA vector is. Is there a relationship between the direction of the dA vector, right? If you draw, if you take any piece of that sphere's area and figure out what direction is normal or perpendicular to the sphere at that point. 
How does that go ahead? Gonna be R. It's going to be R, right? It's going to be R hat, right? It's the same direction, no matter what. Yeah. And this is kind of the key to Gauss's law. So, you know, if, if it's not clear, you have, or uh, you want me to repeat it, ask, right? It doesn't matter which piece of the sphere I pick as my DA, right? And for an integral, we'll, we have to do it over everything. The normal, the outwards direction from that piece of area is always R hat, right? It's always uh, the direction from the center of the sphere pointing out. So we can write our dA vector as just dA r hat, right? The magnitude dA, whatever the size of this little area is. And we're not gonna be able to use dx, dy because it's not a rectangle, but that's all right. Um, but the direction is always in the r hat vector. So, so whatever point we pick, right? The, the, the electric field lines that pass out of the sphere are gonna be parallel to the area vector at that point. Does that make sense? The, the, the electric field lines are always going to be outwards because they're starting at the center and going symmetrically outwards. And the area vector is always going to be outwards as well because, um, because the normal, the parallel, uh, or the perpendicular vector to the surface is always going to be pointing directly outwards. So that means we get an important thing here that we have the, if we just look at the direction part, we have r hat dot with r hat. Right? And we know that if we take the dot product of two identical unit vectors, right, they both have magnitude one, they're both parallel. So the dot product of these two is just one. So that makes uh, this much simpler because now we don't have any vectors. Left. So we just have KQ over R squared dA. Sorry, there's a line on my desk that kind of screws up what I'm trying to write. Um, are, are, is that okay so far? I want to make sure we're pretty clear on the reason why we can we can uh, say that the electric field is in the r hat direction and so is dA. Okay. So now I want to take this surface integral, but before I do that, I notice I've got a the I, what can I pull out of the integral here because it's a constant? The area. Well, the dA is what I'm integrating over, right? So I can't pull the dA out. That's the variable of integration. But then you. Oh. But. Uh, go ahead. But wouldn't the um, electric field be constant? Yeah. Right. The the kq over r squared. Right. This sphere is of a constant radius, right? The R is the same everywhere on the sphere. So as we as we add up, you know, each little bit of area on the sphere, we're not changing R, right? So R is a constant as well as K and Q are both constants. So what we get is, whoops, um, yeah, K Q over R squared. We can pull out of the integral to its constant, and then we just have to do the surface integral over dA. So is that why we don't take the double derivative? The double derivative? Or is this something else? Yeah, I think this is. Um, oh, you mean the double integral like we did the other day? Oh, sorry, double, double integral, yes. So, um, well, this really is a double integral because to, 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 do, the, um, to do this surface integral, we have to integrate over um, both. both and if, if we're talking about polar coordinates, we'd have to integrate both over the, the theta the phi, right? So th this area integral really is a double integral, um, but it's much. But we can kind of uh, gloss over that fact because look at think about what we're doing when we when we're taking an integral over this area here. All we're doing is saying if we take each little tiny piece of area on this sphere, every tiny little piece of area on the sphere, and add them all up, what are we going to get? Mister, I'm kind of confused though. On one You're going to get. Sorry, what? Go, go ahead, Ellie. It's the D. The D. From where is that D coming from? Like, I understand that's like DX, DA, whatever. Yeah. I mean, you have to have a DX or DA or DX somewhere in the integral, but I'm confused where the hell that came from. 
so in an inter so you know in a, in an in the basic integral with a dx right that dx means you know if i'm going to integrate this function if i want to integrate this function right here's my function x y um if i want to integrate the function right what i have to do is is multiply the value of the function times the little the little width right some little width dx right so in this case dx means that tiny little piece of the function you know as infinitesimally small for the integral to be exact um, but it starts off as a as a delta x right so you learn about integral by starting by taking the sum over a bunch of little pieces um, of the function times the times the delta x times the little width of the function right then what we're saying is that as we take that delta x go to zero that delta x becomes dx right it's an infinitesimally small um, displacement along the x axis when we're taught what we're talking about here is something similar except now we're in two dimensions right you could say really if i if this is big enough that i can draw it out i could call this instead of da i could call it delta x right if i you can imagine me breaking this sphere up into like a hundred little pieces each little piece is a delta a and then i would add the area of each of those hundred pieces to get to get the total but the reason we use a da instead of a delta a is because now we're going to be talking about infinitesimally small pieces of the area. Okay. Right. So a da here means an infinitesimally small piece of the the area of the sphere, just like the dx in this integral means an infinitesimally small uh, displacement along the x. Okay. Does that does that answer at all? Yeah. yeah. And it's a little harder, you know. Th these um. Really, you know, we've seen that a you know a dA can equal dx dy if we're talking about a rectangular coordinate, right? Because then your dA is just a, a rectangle. Um, in this case, with the sphere, and I, I have to be careful because there's a r in here somewhere. Um, well, I don't want to talk about it in polar coordinates. I think this will be a little more confusing at this point. It's because it's because earlier in the first equation, mm -hmm. you put uh, what you call it. You normally put the um the, the the area right the area for the this one yeah oh well so yeah we had been talking about some some surface integrals or some uh, some fluxes that were just e dot a right not e dA so we had said those are only good for um, uniform electric fields and flat surfaces right because if the surface is flat it's easy to figure out the area. Right, a rectangle, you just multiply the length times the width. But in general, if the surface isn't flat, it's not so easy to find the area. The only way to really do it for a general, you know, weird looking surface is to break the surface up into, you know, a lot of small, little, almost flat pieces, figure out the area of each of those small, little, almost flat pieces, and then add them up. Right. Right. right? So that's what we're doing here, right? We're, we're saying we're going to break this sphere up. We can't just, well, in general, right? If, if it, it's going to turn out, we do know how to find the air, the surface area of the sphere. That's, that's what our, the value for this integral is going to be. That's what we're getting to now, right? If I do take this sphere and break it up into an infinite or even a large number of small, almost flat pieces and add up the area of each of those pieces, I should just get the surface area of the sphere, right? Right. So that's why we don't have to do much work to figure out this, this uh, integral over dA, right? Because that's what this piece is saying. It's saying, take, and, take all the infinitely small little pieces of area on the sphere and add them up. Okay. And, we know, and we know what we should get, right? I think, I don't know if you actually do this out in, in a, well, maybe in BC or in Calc 3 in college, but, um, but whatever we do, we're going to get the surface of a sphere surface area of a sphere, right? If I take up all the little pieces of area, add them all up, I'll get the surface area of the sphere. So that means I can just replace this integral here with the surface area of a sphere. Uh, and does anybody remember what that is? That'll be the four pi uh, square. Yeah, four pi r squared, perfect, right? So that means the flux through the sphere is kq over r squared 
times four pi r squared. And the r squareds cancel out. So that means our flux through our sphere is just um, four pi times k q, which is pretty simple, right? That simplifies down to just a constant times the charge on the inside. And we can make this look even more simple if we remember that when we first defined k, right? There's another way we learned Coulomb's law besides just being kq over r squared. We also called it one over four pi epsilon naught, right? Just two different ways to write the constant. And we'll kind of see it's, it's easier now if we replace k with one over four pi epsilon naught, because that just means our flux K over epsilon? Q, right? Q over epsilon. Sorry, Q. Yes, but what is epsilon not? That, that's the um, permittivity, permittivity of free space, right? If we go back to the first, you know, the first thing we learned, Coulomb's law, right? It's just, um, it's just K in, in uh, different units, basically. We, Sometimes you go all the way through and not using K and using one over four pi epsilon naught. And it's usually a lot to write. Um, but the reason is to use epsilon naught is because when you get to Gauss's law, it's easier to write Q over epsilon naught than four pi K. Um, mm. But they're, you know, on, on your equation sheet, they're both on there. Um, so here's the, yeah, the vacuum permittivity or the permittivity of free space, right? That's your epsilon naught, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. Um, and then K is uh, up here somewhere too, right? Um, oh, so when we say K, they, they have E with a, with a zero on top. So they're both numbers. They're both numbers. They're both constants. They're both numbers. And you can go back and you can use one or the other, right? So K, K and one over K equals one over four pi epsilon naught. You can, and, and you can, you can write Coulomb's law as either K Q over R squared or uh, Q over four pi epsilon naught R squared. And that doesn't matter. And, and we did that. All right. So epsilon naught is just a constant. So the, the electric flux is just proportional to the charge inside. And it doesn't matter what the radius of the sphere is either, right? We could make the sphere larger or smaller, and we would still have um, the flux through it be Q over epsilon. But then what if it, it was a square instead of a circle, instead of a sphere? Right. OK, so that's what we're going to get to in just one second, exactly where we're going, right? Because this surface, right? The, the, this uh, sphere that we created doesn't have to really exist, right, in space. It's just an imaginary sphere, and we can count the electric field lines that are passing through it. And if we made the sphere bigger or smaller, that's not going to change the flux. And you can kind of think, right, you can, you can kind of see why that is. If you imagine the sphere is a little bit smaller, say around here, right, we still have the same number of lines passing through it because even though the sphere is smaller, the field lines are more dense around it. Right. And if we made a bigger sphere, we'd still have the same number of lines through it because even though the sphere is bigger, the lines are more spread out at that bigger radius. Okay. So uh, going on to um, your question, what if it's not a sphere? What if the surface is not a sphere or the charge um, is off center? All right, so if we move the charge to uh, off to the side, still inside the sphere, right? So if we move the charge like over here, what do you think? What, what's going to happen if the what's going to happen to the number of field lines passing through that sphere, if uh, or the surface, if we change the shape of this surface so that it's something other than a sphere? Is that going to affect the number of field lines that pass through it? And one thing that can help, let me. Uh, yes. Oops. Wrong thing. 
So if we look at these diagrams here, look at this first diagram on the left, right? You can see we've got the point charge in the center. This sphere, S, this surface S1 is a perfect sphere. Uh, we can think that's the one we just calculated Gauss's law for. And then you have S2 here, which is a little bit bigger and not spherical, right? It's kind of weird shape. And S3 is also bigger and not spherical. It's kind of weird shape. But if you look at the field lines, are the number of field lines that pass through each of those surfaces different or the same? They're different. The, the number of lines passing through? The number of lines, they're the same. But... Yeah, it's, it is the same, right? The number of lines, I mean, you can, you can see that you know, kind of like what we said before with the sphere, S3 is bigger than S1, but there's not more lines passing through it because the lines are more spread out by the time we get out. Right? And really the, doesn't, sorry, go ahead. But that, that'd be weaker. Yeah, the electric field is weaker at the surface of S3 than at the surface of S1. That's true. But remember, we're not talking about the, the strength of the electric field at the point. We're just talking about the flux over the surface. So the, the number of lines that pass through the surface. So that means even if we change the shape, uh, it would still be the same. Right. Even if we change the shape, if we made this sphere a rectangle, we'd still have the same number of lines that, that pass through it. Right. If we made it a pyramid, same number of lines that pass through it. Right. If it's amorphous blob, the same number of lines are going to pass through it. We can make it bigger. We can make it smaller. We can change the shape. No matter what we do to that surface, if, if that, if that uh, point charge is still there inside of it, the flux is just going to be that charge divided by epsilon. All right. So, but, 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 but then, but, but the area is changing. So why is the flux still the same? Right. The area is changing, but so is the electric field, right? You increase the surface area. So you're farther away from the point charge. Well, you've also made the, elect you're, you're, now you're dealing at that surface. The, the electric field is a lot weaker, right? Because these electric field lines spread out. Oh, it has to do with it. And the reason, you know, mathematically, um, mathematically, it's, it's this, it's where these R squares cancel out, right? This is our surface area, the four pi R squared, right? And this is our electric field, KQ over R squared. You make a bigger sphere. Yeah, you make a bigger area, but you also make a smaller electric field, right? And it, and it perfectly cancels out because it's R squared over R squared. So, so if the surface is not a sphere or the charge is off center, that has no effect on the flux. Yeah, right. The flux is still the charge over epsilon. And you can see, even if, even if we move the charge around, so let's say the Q wasn't at the center, but over here, right? Now we're going to have, it's going to be, the, the situation is a little bit different because we're going to have lots of electric field lines passing through this side of the sphere, right? Because the charge is so close to it. But we're going to have that many fewer lines passing through this side of the sphere because now the charge is farther away from this side of the sphere. And it's always going to balance out exactly so that the flux through whatever surface is going to be, um, the, the charge over Q over epsilon. So, so then you can change the amount of force that you're putting on the thing, but then the flux will still will still the same. Uh, change. What do you mean by changing the amount of force? Sorry. Well, you can the change. Force will, oh man, I don't know. Just never mind. Never mind. So let's see where 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 we're going with this. So you can say, so remember these, these, uh, we call the, this sphere, we'll call it, you know, we call these Gaussian surfaces, right? They're generally imaginary surfaces just, just, you know, for the purpose of calculating the electric flux through them. And you'll, you'll see, you know, why we get to once we get to the end of the lecture, right? So another situation though, what if instead of just moving the charge around in the sphere or changing the shape of the sphere, what if we bring the charge outside of the surface, right? So maybe we put it, you know, right here next to the surface. Is that going to change the flux through the sphere? 
Yes, that would. Yeah. So let's see if my desk is too crowded. Um, let me put back that diagram. The other diagram here, right? The, this one, figure 24A. Right now we've got a, you know, it's not a sphere anymore, but we've moved the charge outside the surface. What's the flux through, we could do another integral, but I don't think we need to. What's the flux through that, this surface here on the right? Area times um, K, Q over R. Um, well, it would be, yeah, um, we, we have to, we'd have to do the integral, right? Yeah, yeah the, the integral of the Q thing. Yeah. Well, let's not do any more integrals. I don't want to do any more integrals. If we look at this, you can notice that since the charge is outside of the surface, every, every electric field line that enters the surface also leaves. Right? If you look at that diagram, every field line that goes into the surface comes out at some other point. And remember, a field, if the field line is going into the surface, that's going to give you a negative flux. And if the field line is coming out of the surface, that's going to give you a positive flux. So what can we say about the flux if every field line that goes into the surface also comes out? What's the total number of field lines going in or coming out of the surface? Then? The same. Oh. Not the same. Wait, so you're saying the they difference. go in. Sorry, could you repeat the question? The difference is, right, in, the fir in this first diagram, like the sphere or the, or the amorphous shapes, right, the point charge is inside. So every field line is on its way out. Right, so we find the integral. We, we you know, it's kq over r squared times the integral of dA, it's fine. Um, but on this one, then not all the field lines are going outwards, right? We also have some field lines going inwards. And in fact, we can see from this diagram that every field line that goes in also comes out at a different point, right on the other side of the, of the surface, right? This field line goes in over here, comes out over there. This field line goes in over here, comes out over here. So every field line that goes in also comes out. So we're gonna have some little negative flux for this field line over here, some positive flux for this field line over here. Now those don't necessarily have to be equal to each other. Um, are you are you, are you trying to say that you trying to say that the flux is zero or, or what? Yeah, I'm trying to say the flux is zero. Exactly. Yeah. The flux oh, I see. So like it hits something and it can't go through it because. Yeah. Well, it's not that it can't go through it, right? The idea is that we're measuring the flux. It's the number of field lines passing out of the surface, right? But if every field line that goes in, or if every field line that comes out also has to have gone in at some point, right? Then, then every positive little piece of flux has to have a corresponding negative piece of flux. I see. Think of the arrow going into the surface as negative flux, and the arrow coming out of the surface as positive flux. Then we can see that if the charge is outside the surface, we have to have zero flux. Uh, Mister, oh, you've lost me. But then didn't we? But earlier we were doing the Q times the area, four times the area. Uh, so, not of course, right? The, before we were doing the integral of. Let me stop. Your questions are good, right? I want to make sure that they're great questions. It's a hard thing to wrap your head around. Um, so, but before the, right, we, before this kind of simplified down is E dot A because our R hat, right? When we were inside at the center of the sphere, every, every, uh, every piece of area, the DA, the normal to that was outwards in the R hat direction. Yeah. Right. That's always positive, right? Because every field line is, is on its way outwards. Right, there's no field line on, on its way in through this sphere. So we just add them this. When we're talking about the charge outside the surface, right, like that other diagram, right, here's our charge Q now, right, here's our, and it can be a sphere, it doesn't matter, it can be anything at this point. But if we want to measure the number of field lines coming out of this surface, we can do that, right? There's some field lines, here's some field lines. But no matter how we draw them, if a field line goes in, a 
it's got to come out. Yes, but they're always going in the same direction. No, they're not always going in the same direction. Right. But what I'm saying is that for every for every piece of negative flux or for every piece of positive flux that has an electric field line coming out of it, in this case, there's a negative piece of flux. There's an electric field line going in. So it's always going to balance out to zero. So if the charge is outside the surface, the flux from that charge equals zero. So the net flux would be zero for the, the total. Yep. So you're trying to say that, that the, the thing does no work on it? I'm not talking about work. I'm not, I'm not talking about force yet. I'm just talking mm -hmm. about the electric flux. Yeah, you know what? So if you put, I mean, that we're not talking about, so that these spheres, don't think of them as charged, right? They're just imaginary spheres. We want to count, count the number of field lines passing through. And the reason is because now we'll, we'll come up with Gauss's law and we're going to be able to use Gauss's law to work backwards and find the field. Okay. All right. So if the charge is outside the surface like this, then, all, then every electric field that goes out also has to go in at some point. So we're going to have zero total flux. So the conclusion, so what we get from Gauss's law is that the electric flux, which we know is equal to the surface integral of E dot dA, which could be easy or hard to calculate depending on the situation, is just equal to whatever the charge is inside, so that's why this is Q in over epsilon. Right, so if we had, you know, a bunch of point charges inside that sphere, you know, six Q, then the flux would be six Q over epsilon. If you have a, you know, a bunch of point charges in the sphere and a bunch of point charges outside the sphere, you can ignore all the charges outside this or outside the surface, it doesn't have to be a sphere. You can ignore all the charges outside the surface because they're not gonna contribute to the flux through the surface because every field line that goes in is gonna have to come out. So Gauss's law says that we can find the flux through any surface, right? This is true for any surface, closed surface, any field, any charge just So anything with a volume will have zero if it's outside, if the charge yeah, is outside. Yeah, any, yeah, any closed surface, if, if, the, any, if there's any charges outside the surface, they're not going to have any effect on the flux passing through the surface. Only charges inside are going to affect the flux. But doesn't it need uh, like an opening for the flux to get in? Or it's, is that... Right, these are just imaginary surfaces. So um no it doesn't need a so, so i mean you you i'm not i'm not quite sure what you're asking about that so um we, we did like a problem before where it was like a closed box and then we calculated the flux through going through one of the sides and then we calculated the flux going through the entire box um it, the net flux was zero so th that means that like yeah it can't pass through sure. Well, I think, I think, uh, and we did get that because the charge that was making those, because there was no charge inside that box, right? I think in that case, we had the box in a uniform electric field, right? So, and, and we can see when we did that problem, every um, electric field line that passed into the box on one surface passed out through the, through the opposite surface. So that, that goes along with Gauss's law, right? There was no charge inside that box. Um, so, that, so we did get zero for the, for the uh, total flux. I see, but if it, if it was inside the box, then it would be a different story. If there was a charge inside the box, then yeah, we wouldn't have a zero flux, right? Because then the field line would be kind of coming out from whatever charge is inside the box, and you'd have more char more field lines coming out of the box than going in, um, so your flux wouldn't be zero. And the more charge you had inside the box, the more field lines there would be, the more field lines would be passing out, and the bigger your flux would be, right? That's why the flux is proportional to the more charge inside the surface means more flux through the surface. It's a linear relationship, is that right? Linear relationship. So that means if you double 
the flux, you need to double the charge. Oh, really, it's the other way. But yeah, you're right. Really, you're sorry. double the charge, you're doubling the flux. But, but that's yeah. yeah. So, so where we'll go with Gauss's law, right, is, you know, we can kind of almost stop caring about flux at this point, right? And we have this equation, the integral of E dot dA equals Q inside over epsilon naught. So you can kind of see how if we know the charge inside something um, and you know the area, you can solve for E. Right, but only in very in some very symmetric situations, right? Because in general, this is a complicated integral that, that uh, we would never want to do. But in certain symmetric situations, like with the sphere that we had earlier, right? The integral the uh, er the integral over the area simplifies down to a, to an easy expression, um, and then we can solve, and then you can solve for e. So what we'll do over the next uh, there's actually the next uh, maybe a couple lectures. There's really three main, I call them super examples of Gauss's law. Um, and we're going to find the electric field from a, a flat charged plate, um, from a charged cylinder, and uh, for some reason I'm drawing the blank now is what the third example is. Um, so I'll keep you in suspense. Uh, but there's basically only three, three examples that and they, they do have broad use, um, but those are the ones that you'll, that you'll need to know and those are the ones that on the on the AP test. It's never going to be a very general situation where you'd actually have to take an integral over some weird shaped surface. The only time you'll have to actually use it is, is for very uh, symmetric situations where this integral becomes easy or trivial. And that's what we're going to next. We'll take a look at the Gauss's law super examples uh, from here. Uh, but I know there's a lot of questions. I know this can be confusing, so I, want, I don't want to uh, stop this yet if you have any other questions you want to ask about this. I'll probably get more questions when I um, do the, the homework. Yeah, that's true. And when we see the super examples. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll stop this for today.